This is Market Pulse by Faster Forward from Northern Trust Asset Servicing, the podcast where experts share their insights on current trends in the markets. My name is Nadia Kabalovic. I'm the co-COO at Northern Trust Hedge Fund Services. I'm very fortunate to be here today with Grant Johnsey from our Capital Markets Group. Grant, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Nadia. And I'm really excited because this is my first time hosting this podcast, so I'm psyched to do it with you. I'm looking forward to it very much. Thank you. So, Grant, very uh, exciting time in the markets in the last month, a lot of activity, a lot of things going on. Can you give us an update on some of the trends that you're seeing? Yeah, we've actually had a pretty busy month of July and, and, uh, and back half of June. So, I think the biggest trend right now is the rotation that's been happening. We've talked about this in the prior podcast. You've got a general rotation that we've been in for roughly the past 15 years, which is rather long, where growth has been favored over value, large cap over small, and of course, U.S. over non-U.S. stocks. And you've seen that rotation play out by and large since the global financial crisis. We've had the strongest inflows um, uh, in history in small caps, it's particularly IWM, which is the Russell 2000 ETF. We're seeing that position expressed both by buying long to IWM, uh, but also in calls, uh, buying calls. And that's driven a lot right now by retail investors. That's the other trend that I always follow, what are the retail investors doing? Because the retail investors control about 39% of the U.S. equity market directly, and another roughly 15% in, in active mutual funds. That doesn't even include the ETFs, the passive ones like IWM. So they've got a lot of, of impact on the U.S. stock market, and we're seeing this rotation where we've had really good um, you know, uh, flows into small cap. Um, and the other interesting thing is the MAG7 and, and tech and comms have actually had a, a relatively weak period. But it, what's bucked the trend a lot is that uh, crypto, Bitcoin in particular, actually performed well. And that's the first time that I have seen, really, at least in four or five years, uh, the tech stocks and MAG7 actually do poorly and Bitcoin actually do well. It's normally been you've seen Bitcoin track pretty high. Uh, the, the trends that you see in, in tech, the higher risk names over the last four or five years. So I think it's actually, a, a, that is actually a good sign to the market, showing that there is some differentiation and some selection going on by investors right now. So that, that's probably the biggest trend in the equity side. Can you talk a little bit about why you think that these retail investors are looking more at small cap in this environment? Well, I think there's a number of reasons for it. I think firstly, if you buy a dollar right now, the S&P 500, you're getting about uh, uh, 35 cents of that in the top 10 stocks. Actually, the top five, I think, represent 28%. So you're getting a very concentrated uh, portfolio. Uh, despite those top 10 names being 35% of the market cap of the S- uh, S&P 500, they're only about 23 or 24% of the total earnings. So you're buying names in the S&P 5 that are fairly rich, richly valued. Um, I think the other side of it, if you look at the earnings season right now, great earnings growth right now. Um, you know, so far in the second quarter, we're just into the earnings season, but uh, uh, EPS is up about 10 percent in the U.S. and revenue is up about five. And we're seeing uh, earnings per share generally stronger in Russell 2000 than we are in tech names. There's actually been some fading of expectations of earnings of tech names and also AI names. So I think a lot of folks are anticipating this cycle, right? Everything is eventually uh, goes through a cycle and you do have some mean reversion. I think that's what's going on or starting to. The other element is uh, from the small cap side, how much of this is expectation of, of interest rates being cut potentially as early as September. So and when interest rates uh, are cut lower, you typically see small caps perform better. Do you do you think that we will have an interest rate cut in September? I think the case? likelihood, yeah. It's the, So the FOMC meeting September 18th. Um, I mentioned that date in particular because one week prior on September 11th, is when the CPI comes out for the month of August. So the Bureau of Labor, um, uh, you know, CPI numbers are always coming out to roughly two weeks into the following month, which that they're reporting on. So the August CPI is going to be reported in September 11th. The August 2023 CPI ran at about a 30, 3.7% clip. So it's a pretty high inflation number uh, that's going to roll off. And if inflation comes in line with what we've seen in recent CPI reports, which right now looks like will be for what we see right now with this recording in late July, um, it looks like it'll probably still moderate that 2.5%. If that's the case, I think the FOMC is going to get this relatively benign CPI print on September 11th. They release their uh, interest rate changes on the 18th, one week later. I think they're going to be under a bit of, of pressure. Uh, also, uh, if you look at the June data, it's softening and slowing some. So I think right now there's a pretty high expectation. 
The market expects right now three cuts in the, over the rest of the year, about 70 basis points is what the futures market's expecting. Most economists, including our own at Northern Trust, expect two cuts, one in September and one in, in December, about 50 basis points of cuts. I will probably go take the under in that than the over. But if we have continued data that indicates moderating growth and we have a relatively benign CPI update in August that comes out on the 11th of September, I think the, the Fed's going to have a hard time not cutting rates in September. So I think we're looking at potential cut. And I think that could also help this rotation that we're potentially going to see into small caps, uh, you know, into gold. We're still we're seeing some buying into gold uh, pick back up recently as well. So I think that could be a, a, a bit of a pivot in the market. You you mentioned AI. Um, last week, Goldman came out with a report around AI and essentially um, stating that AI mania was, is overblown, um, that it'll cost a lot more to implement some of these AI solutions with the cost being where it is today, then will benefit that it's really not a good trade, really, at the end of the day. I'm curious to get your thoughts on that and, and just in general where you see AI in the market. And certainly you mentioned some of the tech stocks. Um, is what we saw with NVIDIA in the last couple of weeks in terms of their stock price. Is yep. that kind of relevant to this AI mania um, kind of coming to a head at this point? Well, Goldman's a great piece, and I think it's in the public domain. So if anyone wants to look it up, there's a 30-some-odd page report Goldman produced, and they have a number of uh, folks that some of them are interviewed in it. But it's something that it, you know, our readers and, and listeners can can uh, probably find the internet. Um, in a nutshell, their thesis is that AI is going to be a trillion dollar investment and there's no trillion dollar problems that it solves right now, um, in essence. And I think there's a lot of degree in truth in that. We talked about the May podcast, just the pure cost and the energy that it's going to require. And I don't know what type of solutions, you know, if you're looking at it using AI to replace, you know, basic simple processes that you would use low wage for, that's not a great investment to spend trillions of dollars in a tech solution to replace, you know, uh, uh, low wage workers who were, you know, doing the processes manually. So that's kind of the thesis. Now, I still think you're going to see a lot of money being put into the infrastructure. And if you look at what's going on in the stock market right now, there's a difference between the AI infrastructure stocks, like NVIDIA is still very strong, for example. Uh, there's another one, Pure Storage, which has had a nice run. They make flash storage devices. Uh, AI is so fast, you can't use traditional hard drive, you have to use flash storage for it. Um, if you, you know, look at um, Arista Networks, for example, that make these switches that are far faster than, say, what even Cisco can produce, those stocks are still at or close to their all-time highs and are trading at rich multiples. On the flip side, if you look at the stocks of companies that are using AI, those stocks are not doing very well. A mm -hmm. couple of examples, Certera, uh, which is a company that uses AI to help design drugs and to test, uh, do a kind of a theoretical test, that stock's way off its highs. Um, uh, you know, if you look at Symbiotic, which is a uh, uses AI to help automate warehouses, they are automating, I think, all of all of Walmart's major distribution centers. That stock's also way off its highs and has trended down recently. So, the companies that are using AI are not doing as well as the ones that are building the infrastructure. So, I think you'll see that trade continue a bit when you see the stocks like Certera and Symbiotic start to do better that are using AI, I think that's when you know that AI is starting to solve some real problems as opposed to make you know mundane and administrative processes more efficient. And that's going to be the big payoff in AI. Goldman's point was generally that's probably 10 years off before we really see that, that impact. Um, just kind of along the, and I know this isn't a tech podcast, but we'll talk a little bit about just coming off of AI and commodity trading. And I think it was in the May or June podcast, you talked a little bit about trading in energy and kind of the, the flows and what we're seeing there. And I think certainly for me on the hedge fund side and well reported that hedge funds are starting to gain more interest into energy trading, commodity trading, and knowing the um, what it takes to, to drive AI from an energy perspective, just the obscene amount of energy that it takes to run a single chat GBT query, for mm -hmm. example. Um, I think in that, in that podcast, you mentioned that the interest could be because the trades are cheap. Um, do you think it's coming back to the trade being cheap? 
Or do you think it is really this belief in that, you know, AI is, is here to stay and is the future and kind of investing in that underlying energy um, that's needed to drive the industry? It, so I think it's it's both. I think energy is very cheap right now. There hasn't been a lot of, of, of investment into energy, uh, into our uh, you know distribution of electricity, and even into the generation of it. And I also don't believe that the average person, and we talked about this in May, so anyone that missed that podcast can go back and kind of understand some of the 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 hurdles that you are going to face in expanding expanding uh, energy distribution as well as uh, production. It's a it's a two pronged problem. So that's a big issue that we have to you know solve for. And I think there's a lot of money to be made in that in the intermediate and even far off into the future. The there and there's other new technologies that are continuing to evolve too that we're starting to see some of our clients uh, look at like uh, the ability to produce. Uh, uh, energy with natural gas and essentially zero emissions. There's a new initiative now I just read about where people are actually looking to mine uh, hydrogen trapped in the in the earth and using hydrogen as energy source as well, for example. So a lot of things that are happening there that I think are interesting that just haven't been invested in for a while. Even if AI doesn't come to fruition, the reality of it is we continue as a, you know, as a society to use more and more electricity. And there's no expectation that that's going to go down. We've had a period where it's moderated through efficiency gains for the last 10 to 15 years, which is why we've become complacent in both production and distribution of energy and electricity. But you're going to see, I think, more and more of that um, over time. That's the reality is that as technology evolves, we end up using more energy, not less. Even if even if efficiency gains are, are made um, through and through, we've actually continued to use more energy. So I think there's a do- dual play there. It's relatively inexpensive. If you look at energy stocks, they are uh, well uh, outside of, I even think, two standard deviation in terms of how cheap they are relative to the market uh, in historics. So uh, I think that's still playing out. And actually, recently, I've seen some of the hedge fund clients that we represent kind of buying a little bit more into energy even recently. And even getting back to, to some of our retail investors, again, I always really keep close on these retail investors for aforementioned reasons. We're starting to see them. I and mean, one of the big buys that we saw retail investors in the last quarter was utilities. Mm-hmm. So you're starting to see some of that even play out uh, in, uh, in retail investors as well as more sophisticated institutional investors. Back to basics. That's right. Um, you mentioned interest rates, so we talked about that a little bit. Um, curious on your thoughts just in terms of a rate cut and the impact that that might have on the housing market. So the housing market's at a bit of a uh, um, intersection right now between where we're coming out of sort of a, a slower period and the second half of the COVID pandemic where you, you had a lot of folks when interest rates started to, to be raised in uh, late 2022 um, stopped you know, didn't want to move because they had a, a great mortgage already locked in where they were living. Right now, um, as we record this podcast, active listings are up 18% year over year. Pending sales are down 6% year over year. Um, and then according to Redfin, overall buyer demand they're seeing is down about 15% year over year. Uh, on the flip side, I saw a survey done by, I think it was the University of Michigan, a consumer uh, survey. And this blew my mind, 30% right now of, of households uh, currently have a house that's worth over $500,000, and 40% of mortgages or 40% of homes right now are mortgage-free, have no mortgage on them. So if you think about, okay, and if you've got a, you know, a home right now that you're looking to sell and move out of, interest rates, uh, mortgage rates are still in the upper sixes, and it's going to be pretty expensive to upgrade that home, move into a new one. If rates start to come down, I think you're going to get a little bit uh, more selling activity. I think that's going to put... Uh, a bit of a lid on housing prices. You might see a little bit of a decline in housing prices. I don't see anything significant. But again, I think when the Fed does start to pivot to interest rate decreases, you're going to see a number of rotations happen. And I think one of them is some life back into the housing market is is, uh, homeowners and households right now that have decided not to move because they don't know where to move. They don't know what interest rates they're going to end up paying, might consider it more. The bigger issue in my mind is so many folks are still anchored to a period that we've all come to know over the last 20 years of declining and low interest rates. Mm -hmm. That's been a topic we've talked about in these podcasts. I don't, absent a massive recession, don't see that 
happening again in the foreseeable future. And so I also think some of this is the more time that comes and interest rates don't get down to three and a half percent again, or mortgage rates don't get that low again. You're also, as people just wait, they're going to end up getting tired and go ahead and pull the trigger on a, on a, on a home sale. The other element to this is some of the homes you are seeing being built are actually slightly smaller in square footage and space. And there's a bit of a revolt you're seeing in cities kind of around the country with these mega mansions. I think you're going to see homes built that are kind of more moderate in size than what we've seen in the past. And that's also gonna be a reflection of energy prices. I mean, again, we talked about in the May podcast, electricity prices in the US have essentially doubled in the last, I think it was 10 or 12 years. And you're gonna can probably see that continue to go up as we invest back into it. So the cost of heating and cooling and maintaining a home that's you know much larger is gonna be much higher. Do you think that the aging population and baby boomers have anything to do with the size of houses as well? looking to downsize? Possibly. That said, there's actually a little bit, if you look at demographics in the U.S. right now, there's a little bit of a spike right now in the early 30s from some of the millennials who are looking to get out and buy mm -hmm. homes. So I think that's going to, you know, starting to have kids. So I think you might see some offset there. You've kind of worked through the, you know, the Gen X. So if you look at the, the age bracket um, that I'm in, right, late 70s, that was a low of right. bursts. And then it's tended back up into the 80s. And of course, into the 90s, there was a pickup. Those, those, uh, you know, that, that demographic is now at a point where they're having a family and they're having children. And I think that's going to pick up some of the selling for baby boomers. The big question is what size a home and what right. geographic locations do they want to buy in relative to where the baby boomers are selling. And I do think you're going to see certain areas of the country that are going to uh, either benefit or, or not from those types of trends would be remiss not to bring up the elections. Uh, I think that the market has generally been pricing for a Trump win um, this election season, whether or not that happens, who knows. Um, but with Biden opting out over this past weekend of, of the race, want to get your thoughts just in terms of where we are and where we might be going um, in terms of the, the Democratic nominee um, and what that might mean for the markets. So yeah, fascinating time right now, right? We, we've got uh, Biden stepping down from from running as the nominee, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, questions and and potential uh, unknowns still, right? It's already been a pretty wild season um, for a variety of reasons, good and bad. In election years, there are generally four trends that happen as it relates to capital markets. Typically from July, to November, VIX, right, which is a measure of, of implied volatility, goes up by 25%. Usually you see uh, investment grade spread widen before the election and then tighten after. You tend to see equity selling uh, before the election and then equity buying after the election. And you oftentimes see some folks parking money in, in money funds and cash and treasuries. This year, you have seen VIX essentially decline up until last week. We had a pop, but it's already coming back down today. So VIX is not materially higher, really. And, you know, as we record this podcast, I think it's 15 right now. So relatively benign and low. Some of that's the zero days to expiry um, options that have kind of suppressed VIX. But it's still relatively low, and we haven't seen that pick up. IG spreads have actually tightened since the beginning of the year, although they have widened very uh, a little bit recently. But uh, you know, investment grade spreads are still a little under 100 basis points right now, which is very tight. So we're not seeing that uh, play out at all. And again, we talked about this last podcast. I think some of that's because corporate balance sheets are actually really clean and very strong. Corporate earnings are very strong right now, as we talked about. Um, there's been massive uh, buying of equities. So that has really bucked the trend of years prior. Um, and and uh, I'll be curious to see how that continues. So, um, you know, and there, we have seen money flow into money funds. So of what you would normally expect in an election year, not surprisingly, we're not seeing those trends play out this year. And if, if I look forward, so from an outlook standpoint, going into the back half of the summer, into, into the fall, I think there's a few things to, to keep in mind. I do expect there to be some moderation of, of equity buying. I think it's just going to be I I inevitable. Um, if you look at some of the trends right now that I'm following in the market, one of the biggest is, again, going back to retail investors, how are retail investors invested right now? They are uh, about as long in U.S. equity markets as historically they have ever been. And when that happens, you typically see um, short-term bad sign, right? That usually means there's some correction. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of a sell-off. Long-term, that's actually a good sign. Um, that's one. Two, the relative strength of the S&P 500 over every time period I could look at, monthly, quarterly, yearly, it's very, very strong. And I actually went back 
and looked at what does that mean historically. So when we have strong relative strength and we have a very strong market, so the first half of the, of the year, uh, I think the S&P 500 was up over 14%. So if you look at the S&P 500, whenever it's up over 10% in the first half of a year, one month later, it's about a 50-50, whether it's up or down from there. Um, and then six months later, it's higher 83% of the time. So very good sign long-term, very bad sign short-term. So as I think about the election and what's going on right now, I go, all right, we've got a lot of unknowns, a lot of risk, right? There's a, several different trends here that I'm following to indicate some short-term softening, but long-term uh, uh, strength. And I think that could play out here over the back half of the summer. And remember from about you know, uh, uh, Independence Day weekend and until the end of August and really up until Labor Day, it's usually the quietest period of not just the U.S. markets, but global markets. It doesn't take a lot of selling or buying to have a material impact. You know, small impacts in a low vol and a low volume environment can have relatively profound impacts on the actual price direction. So I'd be very cautious here over the next two months because we have had such high strength in the markets and we have these retail investors that are very heavily invested. We have a lot of unknowns in the market, a lot of things that are going on um, that, that are both concerning, but also don't really have much of a conclusion that we can predict right now. And I think the market's going to reflect that. I think people are gonna back out a little through the election period. The last thing I'll mention in the election is the options market is still predicting much higher volatility in October right before the election. So I think the futures VIX market's got an uh, 18, a little bit over an 18 estimate of what VIX is gonna be come October. So um, that'll be interesting to see. But that said, there's not a lot of hedging going on right now. Um, I'm surprised we haven't seen a lot of options selling, right? Uh, either uh, selling calls or puts, which is considered to be more of a low vol strategy. And uh, you can right now, you can hedge a portfolio is, is cheap. Um, as you probably ever can historically. Um, I will say very recently, we have had a few of our clients start to think about hedging, uh, but still very, very minor um, you know, risk management at this point. Most people are still very bullish in the direction of the market. And I, got, I think part of that's just the earnings that we're mm -hmm. seeing, very strong earnings. Do you have any, any pricing concerns or risks that you're, you're focused on right now? Uh, a few of them. So um, one, there's still a lot of amend and extend of both commercial real estate as well as leveraged loans. Last month in June was a record in, in refinancing, I shouldn't say refinancing, really pushing out the maturation of leveraged loans without refinancing them. Mm -hmm. So these, these, these securities, whether they're commercial real estate or leveraged loans or what have you, they are not able to tr you know, refinance them in a traditional way. And so essentially the, the lenders and the borrowers um, have come to the table m numerous times and had to you know, uh, return the, the paper without a proper refinancing. So that's a, that's a concern. So we're still not seeing normalcy in some of these uh, fixed income markets outside of uh, corporate, corporate credit. Um, the other interesting thing is we've had a real pivot uh, away from uh, higher inflation, which used to be the concern for the last two years, and really into growth and worse growth going to continue. Um, and, and geopolitical conflict is also raised a lot in profile in terms of the risk. So B of A's uh, global fund manager survey that they just conducted last month, uh, for the first time in three years, uh, high inflation, or two years, higher inflation was not the number one risk that fund managers were focused on. It was global conflict. Um, we've also had the most bankruptcies corporate-wide uh, in the U.S. since, I think, 2011 for the first half of the year. So we're talking the most bankruptcy since the, you know, kind of the aftermath of the global financial crisis. That said, um, I do want to bifurcate here. The higher quality issuers are very strong. So if I look at the investment grade uh, universe, um, we're seeing very strong investment grade issuance. We're seeing strong demand. Actually, the longer dated tenors are actually doing the best. They have the best demand in the new issue market where we have concerns and where their risk is on the lower end of the high yield market. So right now, the triple C credit relative to B Right, not that far in terms of, of credit profile differentiation, both considered high yield junk bonds. Um, that's the widest spread that those have been in, and gosh, at least five or six years since I've been watching those. So there's, 
you know, some concern on the lower end of, you know, smaller and, and uh, lower end of the credit uh, side. But again, I think these are healthy signs for the market, right? The fact that there's differentiation going on here uh, is a good sign. People aren't just hitting the buy, you know, the mm -hmm. buy button um, indiscriminately without really understanding what's going on in the market. So good, good trends. That said, those are where the gaps, I think, right now, the cracks are going to come from. And, of course, we've talked a lot about fiscal spending. That's not an issue that's going to rear itself up overnight. That's probably a longer-term concern. That's why I would really focus in on what's going on with uh, lower credit profile, smaller and more regional U.S. banks, which, by the way, are also seeing worsening liquidity ratios uh, relative to the bigger banks, too. Do you see private markets playing a role? Uh, private markets are tricky right now. Um, there is... Um, if you actually look at private equity, this is interesting. Private equity multiples right now are getting close to what we see in the pri in the public market. Um, I mentioned the podcast last time around some of the private equity firms are starting to get into buying companies at relatively high multiples where you may not be getting quite the uh, you know the the uh, same return that you that you might. Um, but it's hard to say how that's going to play out. I mean. Uh, you know, private credit right now um, has been a really good opportunity. A lot of the because of the weakness in the banks. So when you used to go finance a, a property, banks prior to the, the uh, pandemic would oftentimes give you 65 cents on the dollar um, in terms of a loan. Now you hard pressed to get more than 50 cents on the dollar. So coming up with that 15 percent, uh, you know, between the equity side and and the and the uh, borrowing of the or the credit side is where a lot of private capital investors are, are stepping in and we're seeing a lot of interest there. So it'll be it'll be curious to see how that all plays out. Um, I, I think there's more opportunities right now in private credit than there's private equity. So Grant, you've talked a lot about retail investors, institutional investors, the things that you're seeing. Can you talk a little bit more about any of your other clients, hedge funds and, and the like, um, and asset managers and the things that you're seeing in that space? Yeah, so firstly, we are still seeing a lot of interest in listed options trading that continues to pick up, especially to to uh, express long views. So our options uh, business is continuing to grow, and we're still seeing a lot uh, of activity there. So that's one area. Um, and as I mentioned, even amongst institutional investors, um, being able to play uh, the, uh, the uh, Russell 2000 trade, uh, uh, the last couple of weeks has been uh, has been done a lot through the expression of options. So we're still seeing a lot of options volume um, that's, ex that's that's going on there. Uh, gold's an interesting one. Very recently, for the first time, we've actually seen some investors buying into gold. Um, if you remember from the prior podcast and some of the trends that we've seen in gold, most of the gold buying has been by big central banks. We haven't seen a lot of investors in the U.S. really invest in gold. And that's starting to change. In particular, I'm seeing some hedge funds start to express positions in gold. I think kind of anticipation of interest rates going up. When interest rates rise, you normally see gold do well. The pause we saw in gold pricing in June was because China is not buying as much or hasn't been. I'll be curious to see how that, that trend uh, changes. The other thing that we are starting to see in the hedge fund space is we are starting to see a little bit of a pivot out of some of the tech names. And again, that's why I'm starting to really pay attention to the rotation that may be happening here because these trends tend to last 15 years or less and we're right at 15 years. So from a timing standpoint, from everything going on the market, the presidential election, the, the pivot out of this low interest rate environment into a higher one, but you know, possibly with some interest rates coming down a little bit. You're starting to wonder, okay, is this going to be the time that you might see small caps emerge, non-U.S., which, look, at earnings, even in developed markets outside the U.S., very, very strong, and emerging markets are starting to catch back up. Very few exceptions to that. Um, so I think that's what's going to happen. And, and then I think from the, the hedge fund side as well, um, probably a little bit less equity exposure that, than I've seen. But I'd love to ask you a couple of questions while we have a few more minutes here. Okay. I mean, your background's been working a lot with our hedge fund clients, and and we've built a big business, you know, with our fund admin business supporting hedge funds. I'd love to hear a little bit about what we do for hedge funds on the on the hedge fund administration side of things. Maybe you could give some context there, and then my follow up question to that as well will be what trends you have seen uh, over that time. Sure. Um, so for us, hedge fund administration is really middle office services, back office services. So we pick up after our clients trade and kind of see things all the way through. Um, very fortunate, in, and I say that with, with a little bit of a grain of salt in that 
we seem to play really well with complex funds. So obviously we have clients that trade long short equity and what have you, but um, we have trading in catastrophe swaps and we talked a lot about energy. Um, really a anything that you can think of, our clients have probably dabbled in or talked about. Um, think post COVID, things have evolved a bit in the market where a lot of the established managers, larger managers, that's where we're seeing a lot of capital flows come in. And that continues to be the case. Institutional investors are really looking at those managers for their strong track record. They've had incredible returns. The market's been strong. Um, and that's translated to a lot of growth. Um, what that has also led to is a lot of managers looking at how they can deploy capital. Um, you can only get so big at, at some point, right? And so um, we've really seen a trend in terms of multi-manager platforms uh, across our clients and across the industry as well, where you have large managers who are seeding other managers. Um, and I think that trend will continue. Sometimes those managers are in-house, sometimes they're outside, um, but it's really been an effective way to kind of deploy that that capital that, that wants to be put to work. Um, the other thing we're seeing, and you talked a lot about retail investors, is this interest in the hedge fund industry to look at a different type of investor base. And so it has historically been institutional investors, high net worth, right? Um, but really looking at some of these more um, wealth channels, looking at where maybe they can plug into retail networks in a different way than has been done historically. Um, and in my 25 years in, in the hedge fund space, I think that we're really at this point where from an investment perspective, the complexity and the volumes are getting to incredible levels that, that we never would have seen right when I started my career in this industry. Um, but then certainly looking at where you can kind of put capital to work and bring capital into these funds that, that may not have existed. Mm -hmm in the past it's kind of an interesting time how how did how did the Madoff situation change things too when you had a hedge fund that had clearly you know misled investors how did that change things for hedge funds and how did that change things in your world we'll assume all of our listeners are of the age of where they remember the Madoff <laughs> situation um, it completely changed things so um, Investors very much expected independence um, and demanded it. Um, and so for us, that really opened up our business um, to a complete complete change kind of a transformation within the markets. So really looking at independence in terms of trade management and trade processing, looking at independent verification, things like striking a NAV, net asset value of the funds. Um, and it's evolved from there uh, to not just be kind of that check the box and what you need to do, but also looking at where managers can focus on generating alpha, generating those returns, and where maybe they're just not best suited in doing certain things in-house. So kind of went from a must do to now like to do because you have providers that can do things in a more effective and scalable way. Um, so it's really evolved and changed where we're supporting clients in terms of regulatory filings. We're obviously managing investor flows and things of that nature. Um, but you know, picking things up from when the trade is done all the way through to seeing the books closed right at the end of the period. But it made off completely transformed the fund administration and outsourcing um, within that space completely. That makes sense when people had no idea what their yeah. positions were and then they were being accounted for and reconciled internally. It opens up the ability for abuse. One more question for you. Where, where do you expect hedge funds to evolve? What are we doing at Northern to, to support that evolution? Where's the, where is the industry headed? Um, we really pride ourselves within hedge fund services on looking at not just what our clients have done historically, but where are they going and what are they doing. Um, we have a platform, very fortunate to have a platform that was built to support one of the largest hedge funds in the world and has now kind of grown and expanded from there to support multiple clients um, that are on the platform. But it the intent is that it's fit for purpose across these different products. So not kind of bolting on different pieces of software and what have you, not processing stub trades and things of that nature. It's really important for us to have a fully um, mapped out trade, for example. It really starts mm. there and kind of seeing it from there. So I would say from an evolution perspective, it's looking at where we can continue to do that. Um, most recently, we've worked to build out a lot more in the energy space and the commodity space where trading you know, was not as heavy as it was 
um, at one point, and, and we're seeing that renewed interest, um, and then different products that our clients might be trading. So really looking at how we can support that holistically, um, and ultimately just making sure that we're positioned for success to continue to be an extension of our clients' business, and at the end of the day, that they're partnering with the right person that can do that. Um, and we're very fortunate to have this broad network at Northern where, as our clients fund domiciles, have expanded into different international um, regions as their fund complexity has changed, as they've expanded their trading products, that we've been able to kind of grow with them and expand our capabilities with them. Well, that's interesting. I appreciate those insights and uh, hedge funds. Thanks. And thanks for doing this today with me. Thank you. Anything else that you want to touch on before we close? No, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think you know, the next couple of months or something, I would just encourage investors to really keep a close eye out with everything going on. We talked about there's a lot of signs that we could have some potential weakness over the next uh, couple of months. But I'm pretty optimistic when we get the, uh, the election behind us. Um, you know, I think whichever president gets elected, they're going to be fiscally stimulating the economy for better or worse in the long term. Um, but I think the next couple of months are ones that I would encourage our listeners and viewers just to be cautious on and to be really careful. I mean, there's not a lot of volume in the market the back half of the summer, so it's not going to take a, a lot of shifts to to have some big impact on the market. And we're seeing some signs that this recent rally is maybe a little long in the tooth. But again, I still don't see anything that I would be overly concerned on right now. But uh, you definitely want to be prudent through the uh, next few months. Great. Thank you, Grant. Thanks, Nadia. And as always, thank you to our listeners, and we'll see you on the next edition of Market Pulse by Faster Forward.